Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Home Tech. I'm Seth Johnson, and I'm joined, as always, by Jason Griffin. Jason, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Seth. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I got my Cedia tickets lined up. Oh, so it's official. It is official, man. I'm going. I'm going to Dallas. <laughs> oh, man. I'm excited. I know. I was bummed you weren't able to attend last year, and, and this is... Uh... This is legitimately the first time I'm hearing this news. You didn't you didn't tip your hand uh, prior to hitting record tonight, so I figured I would I would break the surprise on air. Yeah, this is this is genuine excitement. Can you tell? Yeah, I'm I'm super <laughs> excited to go. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a fun show this year. I, and we uh, we talked to Chris Gamble on our our interview uh, later. Uh, he actually mentioned that he's going to the show as well. So uh, we're going to have a great great little meetup time there. Yeah, no, that's going to be great. I, I look forward to the opportunity to. Uh, uh, meet Chris in in person for the first time. Chris is a uh, a regular, you know, recurring guest on the show. We try to get him on a few times a year. If you're not familiar with uh, what Chris does, maybe you're a new listener to the show. He's a he's a home technology professional over there in the UK, and he runs a uh, in addition to his his small business that he owns over there, he runs a very thriving um, social community around the the live install banner, and really does a great job with that. Love his mission, love what he does with it, and. Um, was happy to have him on the show. He just got back from a, a trade show over there in the UK called Essential Install Live, and and that was the gist of our conversation was was catching up with him and, and seeing you know what he saw of significance out there at the show. Yep, yeah, it's, it's it was a good conversation. I'm glad I'm glad to get him on from time to time and just kind of go over the things that that he's seeing uh, being active there uh, in uh, in the UK and, and certainly an interesting market. Certainly, an inter- it's just a different country altogether. So it's it's certainly yep. interesting to see what they do uh, differently and similar to us. Yeah, absolutely. We got a new patron uh, this week. Uh, we want to send a shout out to Avon Malin. Uh, he donated it over the uh the five dollar at the five dollar plus level and really want to send our appreciation out to him uh at that level at five dollars plus per month you actually get your name mentioned and i want to thank him for putting probably one of the hardest to say <laughs> names he kind of threw us for a loop yeah in Nor- nordic or norwegian name i'm not sure but it's it's definitely not letters we have here uh in the states <laughs> yep yeah and i i hopefully we're pronouncing that correctly and just want to echo what you said, Seth, and, and thank Avon uh, sincerely for taking the time to do that. And if you're listening and you're interested in learning how you can support the show, um, become a patron as well. You can check out more information about that. Uh, hometech.fm slash support is a great way to do that. Absolutely. And it's got a couple of different ways you can support, including our Patreon page. But uh, you can also drop by iTunes and give us a review. Or you can go on Twitter and uh, send us a shout out. I think, I think Jason, we, we kind of passed one of those little milestones there on, on Twitter, right? We did. Yeah. F- 1,500 followers this week. Pretty excited about yeah. that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I've, I have to admit, I've been doing kind of a lousy job on on uh, keeping those tweets coming out there, but we definitely enjoy the engagement we do get out of that. And uh, if you're a fan of the show and a user of Twitter, uh, if you're not following us already, go check us out, Home Tech Podcast, and we do our best to uh, to keep that going. Let, let's jump into the show here. Before we get into our interview with Chris, we do have a handful of news stories that we want to touch on. Um, so let's dive in. The first one, Seth, you mentioned Cedia. Will you be attending the keynote address? We found out today that it's going to be... Uh, Amazon's director of Alexa, so a, a big deal, a gentleman by the name of Charlie uh, Kindle. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that one correctly, um, but that that to me was an interesting story. I'll be I'm curious to know if your uh, what your thoughts are on it, and if you're you're planning to attend that uh, that keynote. Um, I I might not be that the keynote's fairly early on in the week. I think it's on like Wednesday night. I think I'm either getting in late that night or early the next morning. I'm not sure, but. Uh, I probably won't attend the keynote uh, just because it's so early. But um, yeah, you are pronouncing that right. It is Kindle. I've heard his name many, many times. And it's kind of funny that Amazon does have the Kindle, but he's not over the Kindle product <laughs> line. He's actually over the Alexa. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Funny. <laughs> yep. Uh, so I, but back to this story. I mean, I think this is really cool. This is, uh, this certainly foreshadows what I think could be an interesting CDA. Maybe we'll see some launches of um, integrations with the Echo uh, system from from some of our uh, control systems that that we we use and love each day. I'm not sure, but I, I think that um, you know Nest came on and uh, announced that that they would open up an API and it'd be integrated with Control Four first uh, at Cedia one year. I think that was 2013 somewhere in there. And they were integrated with Control 4, but they wouldn't first. It was a little bit down the road. Um, and they uh, 
they've been uh, integrating with other companies ever since. So I'm pretty excited to see this, actually. Um, yeah. I, I think this, this is kind of like some foreshadowing. Yep. I think that it's uh, very interesting. I, I'm sure there's going to be a, a chorus from certain members of the <clears throat> CDA community kind of questioning why a, a DIY company like this would would be giving a, a keynote address at, at CDA. And, and my answer to that would be, you know, this this is the reality. So accept it. I, I think that to me, it's really interesting. I think clearly going into CDA this year, voice control is one of the, the big themes that I, I expect to see a lot of. At the show, I'm sure that's going to be a, a message that, whether we like it or not, is going to be drilled into our head as we visit different manufacturers is, hey, we've got an, an Alexa integration, or hey, we've got our own uh, maybe proprietary voice control solutions. Who knows? I, I think that uh, it's going to be a definitely a, a broad, common theme of the show, I, I should say. I, I did also notice uh, in this story that there will be... Um, Amazon representatives presenting two CDA training courses, which I thought was interesting. Um, one of them is called the business of voice control and the other one is called designing with voice. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, interesting to me that, that Amazon is taking a close look at the CDA channel. I think that, um, I think that bodes well for our hopefully future prospects of being able to, to take this technology, which is very exciting to me. It, it's, Voice control is something, as we've talked about on the show before, that um, I feel like we've turned a corner in in a sense that, um, you know, we're not there yet as, it, you know, in the sense that it's not a mainstream technology, right? But I think we've, we've finally gotten a glimpse of the future and we know that um, it is something that, that consumers want and enjoy using. And so I look forward to seeing how that uh, ties into CDA this year. Yeah, I was I was actually before I left my other job, I was in a customer's home, a massive control four system, lighting everywhere. Uh, he had um, full control four AV system, uh, just add power video distribution. I mean, this is a very very large, approaching six figure system. And I walk in the door and hear music playing and kind of, you know, it doesn't sound great. <laughs> and <laughs> yep. They've got uh, at least that I counted probably three or four uh, echoes around the house, and that's what they were using for their audio. Hey, um, if 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 we think that we're getting friction because a do-it-yourself you know product is showing up to be the keynote speaker at Cedia, uh, I think companies who are complaining really have to kind of figure out what they're going to be doing in the next uh, decade because this this stuff is here; it's coming and. Um, when you when you walk in, you see a job of, of, I mean, it's a very well done job. It has full Sonos system, full integration with Control Four. Um, there was there's no reason for them to be using the the Amazon system other than it's very simple to use and anybody in the house can, can use it. And um, I think that barrier to entry of using your voice is going to be one of uh, it's going to be a game changer for what we do so uh, i think everybody going to cedia just needs to get on board because this is where things are headed yep and i think cedia represents a great opportunity to go into the show with that in mind and, and try to figure out ways that you can uh, not swim upstream against it but leverage it to your advantage and, and get out in front of it and so let's move on to the next story here also related to voice control and that is the launch of a a voice control handheld remote by Dish. So here we got Dish hopping on the voice control bandwagon as well. Great, more more things to yell at. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I do like this. I mean, there's a there's a Comcast Xfinity has an X1 system now that has a uh, voice control remote that people I actually get people think that they say this is really cool. I really love using this. Um, so as easy as the Amazon uh, Alexa or Echo is to use and, and play music and read news and things that kind of th that kind of nature I, I think that the, the next logical step is getting a, a voice control remote um, but the, the problem I have with all of these these systems is that they're all you know different they're all doing voice control differently they are going to work differently because of that like they, they're not a standard protocol they're not a standard thing to do uh the voice recognition in the uh the alexa system is going to be much different than the dish network remote or the x1 remote or even the savant remote for that matter and you're going to have to learn how to speak to these strange little devices which is <laughs> kind of weird but you're going to have to I think this is going to be a skill set. Like, how good are you at going between the Savant and Dish Remote and talking to them? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. 
you know, I think we've we've touched on that before, but um, yeah, I, I think it's a great point, one that that users definitely need to think about. But I, I think this will clearly, assuming that it works well, of course, it'll be a nice thing for uh, people to have that maybe don't have or need a big um, overarching control system, and they just want uh, a little more convenient way to control their TV. Um, it's got a, a clickable touchpad on it as well. Pretty nice looking remote. Looks pretty compact. They said it's about um, half the size of a traditional um, dish remote. Looks like existing dish customers can can buy one of these for $30. So fairly uh, inexpensive. And of course, stating the obvious here, but the big question will be, um, how well does it work? I mean, that that's the big thing with voice control. And, you know, how much do you have to over enunciate right to get it to understand what you're saying and um, if it's too unnatural or too unreliable people very quickly gravitate back towards what they what they know works but i will be curious to see how this uh how this is received in the market yeah i i think where these remotes will start to shine and and begin to shine uh, it the killer feature for this is is search right because nobody wants to toggle left right up down to type in game of thrones when you can just say push a button and say game of thrones you'll find it that way um so i I really think that's that's where uh these particular devices are going to shine and not not so much as um you know i I don't know what else you could do with it i guess you can change channels and and do that kind of thing there's a couple of things but what really stands out to me is search and and being able to just dictate what you want to have happen or search for rather than have to type it out on your TV screen, which was always a nightmare. E- yeah. Going back to the old Apple TV is just a, just a nightmare. Yep, I agree. Well, let's move on here, Seth. We actually got some new news out of Nest this week. I could hardly believe it. They're shipping a new product. Uh, the Nest Cam Outdoor is what it's called. And, um, you know, some interesting features on this product, I guess, mostly what you would expect from an outdoor camera. But, um also some drawbacks. I, I am a little, I, I don't want to use the word perplexed because I, I get why they made the decision, but I'm a, a little, I'm questioning uh, their decision uh, as to how they decided to handle power. Ugh. <laughs> right. Exactly. So it, it ships with a 25 foot power cable um, that you, that kind of dips out of the bottom of this strangely designed little camera that has a magnetic mount. I mean, this is, this is such a strange thing for an outdoor security camera that is totally accessible to uh, anybody with a a broomstick. Maybe I I don't know. (laughs) Like, well, yeah, like I was looking around my own house just hypothetically thinking, okay, well, if I was interested in buying one of these and, and thinking about where I was going to install it, you know, where would that be? And I I couldn't find a single location that wasn't within easy reach of, of uh, a would-be intruder who could just, you know, simply unplug it. And I guess Nest's ar- argument in that instance would be, well, if, you know, if it un- got unplugged, you would, you would receive a notification. But, you know, if all I wanted was a notification, surely there are, you know, easier ways to to accomplish that. So kind of self-defeating there. Yeah, I think, I mean, as integrators, I'm sure we were all hoping for uh, PoE, which is is power over Ethernet. You you would get a line, like an Ethernet line out to it and and plug in uh, that way. Nest has a pretty good Wi-Fi system set up, so I can kind of understand why they did this. It wasn't a very expensive or um, crazy thing for them to do. They didn't have to retool an entire camera Uh, because if you look at this uh, aside from the monarch butterfly that's on there i'm sure that doesn't ship with it (laughs) um it looks exactly like the nest cam uh, other than the like plastic housing that goes around it um so it's it's just kind of like the black nest cam that we're we're all all used to and being shoved into a different base essentially with a, a a magnetic mount which i that's kind of what throws me off the, the, more than anything yeah. is the magnetic well, mount. Yeah. So my understanding of that is that's that's an optional thing for people who just want to avoid drilling all together. Uh, there is a way to screw it into the wall. So it's not you're not you're not completely stuck uh, using the magnetic mount, but they do have that uh, as an option. Doesn't strike me as a very good idea if you were going to install it. But you know, I, I suppose to me the power cord is is worse. You know, I, I get it. I understand why they didn't do POE. Surely it would have driven the cost up. At the end of the day, ultimately, 
Nest is they want to sell uh, direct to a consumer, and a lot of consumers probably don't even know what what PoE is, and you know, getting an Ethernet cable to the exterior of the house is uh, probably a, a much bigger undertaking for most people who presumably will have a, an existing electrical outlet somewhere that they can use. But one of the things I was thinking was, well, you know, are they even going to give us the option? It doesn't look like it from the best I can tell. Um, it looks like this is kind of a prefabricated power cord, but, you know, they didn't even give us the option of like a little Phoenix connector with a, a cable that you could field terminate. So, you know, what do you do if you've got an electrical outlet within six inches of where you want to put the camera? Like, what are you supposed to do with the extra 25 feet of power cable? Zip tie that thing up, man. Just stick it, like, just, stick it or just let it hang <laughs> down. I mean, that's... I, well, that's what most people yeah. are going to do. Well, I, and you said drive up the cost. That that really struck me because this thing is $200, right? Like, mm-hmm. if it drove up the cost any, I I would not believe it. But because if you look at the other, like the competing thing, competing wired wireless cameras of this type, um, you know, we have an interesting article from Dave Zatz, three outdoor cameras better than Nest, the Nest outdoor camera. Like I, I'll give him two. I'm not going to give him the, the, the Kuma, the Kuna, because that's the, the ugly one that screws into the light bulb, um, socket. Yeah. I'm not going to give him that one, but I'll give him the Arlo and I'll give him the, uh, the ring, which, which as much as we made fun of it, it actually has a battery. Both of these have battery, um, oh, options. Right, right. Um, so you can actually, the Arlo actually, I think takes two double A batteries, like standard double A batteries. Um, and you know, you'll have your mixed results on, on, on that, I'm sure. But, uh, and, and the ring you have to kind of pull down and recharge every now and then. But Arlo, you get two cameras for two ninety nine. The ring is one ninety nine, but it has batteries. So you don't have to worry about these wires or anything. I, 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 I gotta say, I mean, this isn't really a competitive offering unless you're already in the nest ecosystem and you can figure out what to do with what to do with yeah. 25 foot of wire, yeah. because th- this thing is, I don't know, I, this isn't compelling to me. I think they miss miss the mark on the design completely. I do too. I think the, the problem I, I, and I did a piece, uh, over at Resi systems, um, where I talked about this, I think, I think the problem with this outdoor cam is that it, it sits on the fence in what I mean is that it's not going to be convenient or easy enough for the average consumer to install. They, you know, if they really wanted to go just straight consumer play, they would have been better off going in my opinion, with a battery operated solution, sort of like the, uh, the Arlo that you mentioned, if they wanted something that, you know, pros could get excited about, they've got their nest pro program. If they wanted something that we as home technology professionals could, could get excited and get behind, they, they should have done it with POE or, you know, at the very least, like I said, a a Phoenix connector with a, a cable that I could, you know, easily fish through a wall and then field terminate it to the exact length that I want. But instead it's just kind of this weird, middle ground that that I don't think is easy enough for the average consumer and it's definitely not something that that I'm excited about as a as a home technology professional. And and definitely it's not something if I try to install this on the side of my house and had 25 foot of cable going somewhere. I mean it's it's not going to pass the spouse acceptance factor like that's 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 a no-go already. For $200 for all that it's missing, all that it actually is, mm, I I I wouldn't recommend it. I agree. I think they missed the mark here. Um, it's unfortunate we finally got a new product from Nest, and you know, I I'm not a, a hater on Nest by any stretch. I want to see them do well. I think that uh, big companies like that can help build awareness in the industry, and and I think it's inevitable that we will see uh, big mainstream companies like that succeed. So I say sooner the better, but um, I just feel like Nest uh, missed the mark on this, and it's just not a product that I see succeeding at least in its current iteration who knows maybe they'll maybe they'll change gears a little bit on it but i i wouldn't hold my breath yeah well speaking of uh missing the mark uh helos is back in the news um trying to push itself back into the uh, the spotlight um or at least make some of the spotlight shine on its products <laughs> uh, when when most of the spotlights is is these days still shining on sonos yeah it's very true and and i've i've been a little surprised by that i mean we saw Heos come out at Cedia uh, two years ago. So 2014 is when we really uh, were able to put our hands on it and uh, take a look at it on the show floor. And, you know, it seemed like a great product to me. It, it definitely um, 
a me too product, you know, it's, it's very similar to Sonos. A lot of the form factor in the app, I think we joked about it on the show a couple of years ago that it, it really looked almost identical to Sonos. And there's actually been <clears throat> some litigation between the two companies. Um, I think Sonos filed suit saying they infringed on, on some patents and that's all been going back and forth. But at the end of the day, I expected Heos to have a little, a little bit of success because they're really, at least the message we were hearing is that they were going after the integrator and letting us uh, take a system that could function on its own very well as a standalone system, but would also have the ability uh, to go integrate with third-party control systems like Control4, RTI, Crestron, Savant, you know, you name it. And we've just seen slow development on that. And, and I don't know about you, Seth, but I just, I have yet to see a single one of these systems out in the wild. Yeah, I haven't seen one either. Um, as much as as much as a nice system it is, is I I think they have just such a mountain to scale that that Sonos was first to market with this product. Um, Sonos has been not friendly to the integration market, but they, there's been ways to use and control the system. I think everybody has got used to using Sonos, so there's it really doesn't stand up to be like an alternative. They're they're going to have to do uh, something something different to get the Heos line into people's hands without them having to buy a Sonos system uh, or think about Sonos in the first place. Uh, and, and in this article, it's interesting. They, they're saying that Marantz receivers and preamps are going to ship with uh, the technology built in later in the year, which I, I think is great. Uh, I guess both Denon and Marantz receivers uh, will be shipping with it built in because usually when you buy a, so a Sonos system, if you had a receiver, an AV system, uh, you, you're going to pay what a 349 for the connect, um, just to get Sonos activated onto that receiver. Um, I think this is great for them. Uh, I would love to see Sonos built into a receiver. I'm not sure that'll ever happen, but I'd, I'd sure love to see it. But uh, Denon, Denon doing this uh, for both Denon and, and Marantz receivers, I think is going to get their numbers up a little bit more because why would you go buy 349 more when your receiver already has pretty much the functionality you're looking for built into it? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's a smart move on their part. I think they should have done it years ago. Um, and yeah, I, I think that uh, they, they probably could have launched with this if they wanted to. Yeah, yep. That's kind of the gist of the articles they talk about. Maybe they launched a little uh, too soon, or, or perhaps another way to word that is they didn't have the drivers ready quick enough. I mean, that was one of their main messages they were trying to convey is like, we are the integrator-friendly alternative to Sonos, but kind of got put out there and... We don't have any drivers. We, there, right. were, Sorry, yeah, guys. there weren't any drivers, <laughs> so there wasn't a lot that we could we could do with it to, to differentiate. And like you said, I think that the big hill they have to climb is just the, that, that first mover advantage that Sonos has is, is still very strong. And that was the, the conversation we had when we initially saw this product is, are they, are they going to be able to overcome that? And, uh, so far, I think the answer is no, but I think the, what, what they're trying to do in terms of maybe putting a little more leverage into that, that, uh, you know, the fact that it is a Denon product and and there is that relationship there and denon is a long-standing um, brand that a lot of integrators trust and, and consumers are aware of um i think it's a smart play time will tell if it if it pans out for them uh this is another one where i'll, I'll say that i i wish them success i certainly don't uh you know relish in the fact that they haven't really seemed to gain any traction i i think we could use more uh, viable market alternatives to sonos just to keep them honest and and keep them innovating, but uh, so far we just haven't seen it from Heos. Yeah, and, and no voice control from Heos either. <laughs> yeah, that's the big question, right? When are they going to have voice control? I guess they got to lay a few people off first. Oh man, that's just ridiculous. I I, <laughs> I still see that uh, Sonos is. I've seen them tweet that actually acknowledging that you know they're going to do uh, voice control. I just don't understand. I guess I understand it. it. It makes sense for their product line, but just you know integrate with somebody. Can, and get get the API done and integrate yeah. with the uh, with the Amazon system, and uh, you'll be good to go. Right? Can Heos do AirPlay? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm shocked you don't know that. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> it goes to show you how much I know about Heos two years right. after it was launched. <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. All right, Seth. Well, uh, I think we'll uh, move into our interview here. Like I said, we've got Chris Gamble. Uh, from Live Install, Chris is a, a great friend of the show. We try to get him on a few times a year, and he joined us this week to 
uh, give us the rundown on what he saw out at Essential Install Live. So let's get started. Hey, Chris, welcome back to the show. How are you? Hi, Jason. I'm very well. Thank you for having me back on your show. Our pleasure. We're happy to catch up with you, and, and we enjoy these uh, periodic conversations uh, with you to, to catch up on what's going on uh, over on your side of the pond. And we know you just got back from the Essential Install Live show, and that's really the main thing that we're going to discuss tonight. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. But before we dive into that, give us a brief uh, you know, personal catch-up. What's new and exciting in your world? Okay, I'm, I'm still busy as ever with, with Customized. Uh, middle of the summer here, school holidays are starting. We've got lots of deadlines, the usual ones, um, sporting events. You know, I need my big screen up before the final of this sport or that sport. Uh, and also, uh, because it's the school holidays, people are yeah, doing some work on their homes or they've got time off to um, to host you in their homes. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're busy as ever, um, just plugging away, really. Sure. So you guys deal with that too. I know in our industry here in the states, the one of the big ones is is the Super Bowl. Every every um, company here uh, operating this industry has that big Super Bowl rush uh, leading up to the big game, and everybody wants their their media room or theater completed. And so it sounds like you guys have a have a similar thing going on over there. Yeah, exactly the same. It's normally in the UK, it's centered around football, but uh, with a round ball and. Um, you know exactly the same. People want the them set up before the final or before that first first kickoff. Right, right. And we were chatting before the show a little bit. I understand you got a couple new uh, a couple new dealerships lined up. Yeah, it's it's something that's part of our, our sort of five years in business, which we celebrated last month. Uh, five years of customized, and we we decided as a business we would add a couple of new brands, uh, fill in some gaps in our service lines. Um, one main one was um, to plug a, a retrofit solution, but for the higher end sort of luxury property. And we've identified Crestron as our service provider there, uh, primarily their, their ping range, uh, their ping hub, and all the, the products in the Crestron range that it, it works with. Um, we've also chosen to higher demand in requests for home cinemas. We've linked up with the company Pure Theatre just to access their ready-to-go out-of-the-box home cinema projects, uh, products, which range from uh, motorized screens, uh, projector lifts, and all the accessories that are associated with a with a theatre install. Very cool. Well, sounds like things are going great for you. Happy to hear that. Let's uh, let's get to what we're really here to talk about tonight, with which is Essential Install Live, and I know. Uh, this is a big, big trade show over there in the UK, and you recently were, were able to go out there and, and spend a couple of days. And uh, let's start for our listeners who aren't familiar with Essential Install Live and just give us the high-level view. What is that show all about? Well, Essential Install Live is, is brought to us by Essential Install Magazine, uh, the most popular trade monthly magazine for, for installers. Um, they have two events per year, a North and South show. The one that's just passed was Essential Install South, which was about 10 miles outside of London. It's attended by well over a thousand members of the of the public, uh, sorry, of, of our trade, and over a hundred exhibitors, some very familiar, uh, well-known brands, and then others, you know, new, new suppliers to the industry. So another chance for, for us as a business to meet familiar faces, uh, but also meet some new suppliers for our business. Very cool. It looks like the um, the North Show is going to be sometime in, in October, uh, later on in the year. Um, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, what, what, how did you like the show? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you, what you got out of it this year. Well, we've, we've been going to the show now for, that would be our sixth year attending. And like I say, it is the, the number one trade show um, and it's it's a firm date in our diary every year we get out of it um, just that that face-to-face -face interaction with our suppliers away from the usual email and and telephone chains uh, we can go there and and just have a good sit down spend some quality time with our suppliers uh, and look ahead to what's what's new and, uh, and also look back on 
maybe what's what's not been working for us this year, we can help them improve um, their service to us, and, and and we can also push them to um, to bring in some new products or or make their systems a lot better. Cool. This kind of the standard trade show thing that uh, as a as a dealer, as a uh, you go do it, go in and you talk to the wholesalers about you know getting set up with um, better product uh, or. or a, not m- better pricing on the product, I guess I should say. Or and uh, you you go in and ask them, you know, what kind of deals they can do for the for the the upcoming year. So yeah, sounds sounds just like Cedia um, for you know any of the dealers that are that are listening there. I'm sure they're familiar with that process. Um, I saw you saw you know through the grapevine that you were on a, a panel. It looked like uh, with uh, Julie Jacobson over at, from CE Pro. It looks like she was in attendance as well. Um, what what can you tell us about that? Well, CE Pro are a big part of the Essential Install Magazine um, organization. Both publications are part of Electronic House uh, lineup of of, uh, trade magazines and and consumer magazines that they have. So Julie was there in her capacity as as editor-at-large for CE Pro, but she's heavily involved with CE Pro Europe, which is another publication, and... Essential Install Magazine, um, I think is a great opportunity for her to see what's happening in the UK. And I'm sure she probably combined it with uh, with a holiday with with her family. Um, the panel was a one hour discussion between Julie as the host, myself as a as a panelist, and Chris Hogg, uh, the other panelist. Uh, Chris Hogg is a just past chairman of CDA. Europe, Middle East, and Asia, um, uh, sort of Middle East and Africa, and very, very vocal person within the industry, well known, um, much like myself, was the, the active with the live install Twitter account. Uh, somebody with some views on on the industry. So the organisers of the show asked us, the three of us, to tackle a few on trend topics and share our views with with the audience. Very cool. That, that's one of the the funnier pictures I saw come from me. I live was actually um, on the slide deck. Julie actually changed her name to Chris Jacobson yeah. to match you and Chris, which yeah. <laughs> so it was three Chris's, <laughs> essentially speaking. Um, so I thought that was pretty good. Um, what what broad talk, topics did you talk about there? Some were were verging on technical. So we we discussed the divide in in home automation between well sort of. The divide in projects between home automation and home entertainment, and how um, that there is a clear divide in, in projects in the UK with those two two sort of divisions. Uh, we talked about current financial um, and economic situation with the the Brexit vote, the referendum we've held in the UK, and how that's affected us as, as small business owners. Uh, and we also talked about. Uh, Business practices like the use of subcontractors, uh, the use of specialists in your business and not uh, trying to be the the master of all and trying to bring in specialists on on projects. Very interesting topics. And I I definitely, you mentioned uh, Brexit there and and, uh, time permitting, I want to get your thoughts on that. I know it's it's not in the home technology realm, but I am curious as to how that, you know, what what kind of impact that's going to have on your business. But Let's circle back to that. Um, I, I want to touch on one thing that you know, Seth was drawing a comparison to uh, Cedia, and most of the listeners to our show will probably be familiar with the fact that uh, the big trade show over there, ISE, um, is a collaboration between Cedia and Infocom. But my understanding is that Cedia used to host a show in the UK, and they've uh, since stopped doing that. And that kind of uh, left a void that, um, as I understand it anyways, um, Essential Install Live sort of filled that void. Is that a, Would you say that's an accurate understanding? It's very accurate. Um, it's, it's well known that um, Cedia had a show in the UK. They concentrated their, their efforts into a, a much larger show, ISE in Amsterdam. Um, and it left a gap. It left a gap, certainly in the, in the south of England, because Essential Install had, had started their own show in the north of England to service that northern install business. Um, then the opportunity to come up to have a show in the south, they grabbed that with both hands. It's grown from very much a smart home home tech show, one-day event, to 
now two full days uh, and boasts exhibitors from not just residential but also a commercial background so that bringing in that efficiency for for my business if I relate it to customize that we can see suppliers and, and, and vendors from both sides of the technology um, requirements for buildings you know whether it's commercial or residential right right that well that makes a lot of sense let's uh let's talk about what you actually saw at the show um, we asked you to kind of gather some thoughts on a few of the the key broad topics or themes that you were uh, paying attention to out there. And I know one of them that you mentioned here in our notes was uh, service providers. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. And it, it kind of ties into what we talked about following ISE uh, as a business. We're, we're actively out there looking for suppliers to our business, not just products or, or, or box shifters. We're looking for service providers to help us uh, win projects, manage projects, monitor projects once they're completed, um, make sure that you know sub parts of projects, whether it's you know a lot of it we we're very very competent with, whether it's entertainment or automation, but there are things like security and fire, which we do not have the expertise in that, and, and we don't claim to. So we it was good to see providers at the show who are offering fire and security integration skills uh, to home automation professionals and just taking that headache away that could get you bogged down it could get you wrapped up in in a mess that you you know you didn't you, you don't even want to be wrapped up in that with the, the red tape surrounding those kind of services um, so we saw security specialists we saw companies providing monitoring services like the the demots um, solution and and Krika was a, a new product and we we caught up with people we met at ISE the, the guys from design flow who do um, design and proposals for in, install businesses and we also caught up with the, the people behind project Q which is a, a very simple sort of first response quoting tool for for small businesses very cool you mentioned one there that I, I want to get just a couple additional thoughts on it's one that um, I've just become familiar with recently, at least by name, and I don't know a whole lot about them. Uh, you pronounced it Krika. I've heard it pronounced Krika. Um, my understanding is sort of a, a similar product to an Ihiji or a, or a Domots, for instance. I'm not sure how deep you got with them, but what, what can you tell us about that that particular product? I didn't get to spend a great deal of time with them. Um, but yeah, the overview is it's very much that box that sits on the network uh, and just keeps keeps a check on everything um, that's that's connected, uh, built-in alerts, uh, schedule schedule tasks, uh, reports for you as the install business and, and possibly as as the homeowner. So yeah, yeah. Very, very similar, and I think we're going to see you know, even more more of these appear in the next next twelve months. More service providers to monitor the network. Very cool, very cool. Um, you have a couple notes here about HVAC specialties and and security specialists. Um, that that you saw at the show um what what do you i mean i'm pretty familiar with what we do here in the states i'm sure it's similar where you you have a uh, um like a for security you have a, a security panel that's hooked up to a um, a monitored uh, alarm system and, and that calls out to a, uh, a monitoring station and they, they dispatch the police or fire department as needed. Uh, it's probably very similar there. Uh, what, what are you seeing? Uh, what's new in that, that realm over there uh, in the UK? Yeah, very much the same, same kind of setup. Um, but for our, from our perspective, it's, it's an area where you could very quickly get into a mess if you tried to take it on your own, you know, in house or with your own hands. So, and there's there's a lot of red tape on, you know, if you start messing around with these systems, it, it drops the the grading of of the security or fire system and, and just doesn't hit the meet the demands of the what the property ex, is expected to have. Um, so to be able to bring in, you know, that specialist in in especially in security and fire, you know, I just think it's something that's, there's, there's luxury homes, maybe not getting the right uh, service 
for these maybe because of the limitations of the, of the install business um we don't want that to happen we shouldn't be letting that happen so to come to these shows and meet meet specialists you you've got to you've got to set up these these uh, relationships with them yeah that that kind of ties back into what you were saying with the um uh, back in the panel discussion you were having about bringing in specialists, um, you know, I, I, it, I think Jason has even mentioned this before. Like when we are designing a home theater, if somebody really wants a home theater, we bring in a home theater specialist, somebody who can do the acoustic design and paneling locations, and you know, make sure that everything is uh, designed correctly from the ground up. Uh, same thing can be done, you know, uh, with with smaller systems like security uh, and and. HVAC just to make sure that you know the mechanics get done correctly uh so I am all for bringing in you know uh, bringing in uh what do you call a professional a pro hiring a pro to do get the job done right so I'm glad to see that there's there's some effort and some push uh I don't see much of that here in the states because I see a lot of guys who try and try and do everything themselves and uh it it can be disastrous but I, I the ones that have the really cool you know bespoke pro- projects tend to lean on a lot more uh, expertise than, than you realize. And to get those jobs pushed through, sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, let's touch a little bit on uh, some of the video uh, HD over network systems that you saw. I, I saw that uh, Bluestream was showing off the their 4K solution this year. Um, do you have a chance to take a look at that? Yeah, we spent some time with Bluestream. It's a product that we use um, more so the traditional HD base T product, so you know, fixed format for four inputs, four outputs, or eight inputs, eight outputs, um, over a single CAT6 cable. Um, we're seeing projects demand much, much more than than eight screens in, in the larger properties. Um, and they're also pushing the distances further and further as properties are expanding in size or extending in size. So to be able to offer a network-based solution uh, from Bluestream now is great for us, but we're well aware that there's existing providers with that technology, whether it's uh, Just Add Power or Wirestorm with their network HD. Um, I think Geffen also have a a product which I've not had a close look at, but I noticed it won an award at the at the Smart Buildings Awards, which also runs. Uh, is is held at the at the show every year, um, so yeah, HD over your network. It to me it just pushes the the need for to ensure that your network that you're installing, you know, the, the Cat six cabling, Cat six A cabling. That there's even more on it now. So as well as just your you know your data demands, you're also going to start be you know pushing high definition or four K content around that same network so it just just you know emphasizes the need for that that robust wired network yeah that's one of the uh product just that power is one of the products the 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 place i'm working now specializes in and uh setting up and deploying those systems for dealers uh and it is it's it's a tricky one some it can be a tricky one sometimes especially if you have a you know unconventional uh, set up. You want to make sure that things can be done right. It, it, it's it's a completely different way to think about video and and you know how you get that around the house uh, than it than you were doing before with traditional HDMI matrices and uh, you know HD base T matrices as well. Um, I think we're talking a little bit over the head of, of <laughs> some of our listeners here, but uh, suffice to say these are very very high end, very technical uh, systems that pipe video from you know a central location uh out over a it's, a, it's essentially either a standard 10 100 network or even gigabit or uh 10 gigabit network um out to uh TVs which have decoders and they decode that video back into you know video information uh and spit it out to the TV over an HDMI cable uh and like you said there's a number of different manufacturers that are that are selling very very similar systems and uh i'm curious to see what that looks like in the next couple of years because i'm I'm hearing a lot of rumors that 
these systems that they're selling, the 4K systems that they're selling for uh, video distributions are, are, are some of the only systems out there working right now. Like the HD Pace T really hasn't hit true just yet. I mean, there's there's a lot of solutions out there, but um, they're very tough to implement, especially in retrofit situations um, and have, you know, all the check boxes ticked off uh, to make sure that you are getting true 4K content out to the TV. Um, that it's very very difficult and i think <laughs> jason and i have been talking about the difficulties associated with 4k and and where that was going to be here in the in, in the near future and i think we're there now like you're, you're seeing those troubles start to pop up and it's good to see that there are more and more of these you know video over ip networking solution or matrixes solutions that are coming online um to kind of save installers the headache of having to deal with you know other small issues that come from traditional systems um do you see anything else there that you like to talk about uh, what was what was going on and uh, you have a note here about making money with tvs which is which is a difficult thing to do in in today's market yeah it's, it's that's been a a bugbear of in, in, install businesses for a long time that it's, it's difficult to make money on on screens um but one way that we have as a business is by offering bespoke options for televisions uh, and with that we were able to offer mirrored screens, screens hidden in artwork, uh, screens for, for bathrooms or, or wet, wet areas of the home uh, and, and now I think you know topical it's the summer we're also seeing in the UK you know requests for outdoor television you know, whether it's in a, in a porch whether it's in a you know, so outdoor kitchen area in, in a garden. Uh, we saw two or three suppliers uh, of of bespoke TV solutions, um, which which was great because you know there's some margin there. There's um, it's it's seen as a, a luxury product, but it's actually something that's quite simple to install because at the end of the day, it's just a display and it's got the same inputs as as any other screen a lot of the time. Um, so that it, I I do see it as a way of of making money out of out of TVs, which we couldn't with your standard lineup from the likes of Panasonic, Sony, LG, for example. Um, but we can with with bespoke screens. Right, right. It's a great point. Good way to good way to think about it. Um, so those those are some some of the good themes, and and I enjoyed uh, hearing your input on that. L- to get a little bit more. Uh, specific? Did you have maybe a, a particular favorite exhibitor, or one or two favorite exhibitors that you saw um, out of the show? Yeah, we we were asked by the organizers to have a look, uh, look around, and or I was to to find this sort of live install pick of the show and what what caught our eye. And I, I tried to look um, around some of the smaller exhibitors just to see if there was something that was that was slipping under the radar. I was looking for accessories to make installations quicker and easier um but whilst having my look around going jumping back now to the security specialists that were there i spoke to the guys at coordinated who are based in northwest london and they were showing off a, an integration solution they've got with uh, a fire panel and integrating it with a, a crestron install in a, in a property and it just came up with a really easy way for the homeowner to to get alerted you know, of, of a fire and where it was in the property, which, you know, that's a vital, you know, an essential part of, of a of a sort of large home to to notify the homeowner. But they presented it in a very easy to use way. Um, the customer did not have to uh, head off down to the plant room or the basement to find panels and, and reset devices. There was some hot keys uh, to reset there were hotkeys to call the integrator or call the security specialist um all all from the 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 comfort of their touch panel or their their tablet or smartphone app Uh, and i just know that that's it's that kind of expectation that customers have that surely i can reset it from my touch panel well no not unless you you go that step further with the with some with some, you know, some integration skills. So I picked that out. I thought 
they're li- that shows you they're listening to to the homeowners and not just pushing pushing uh, uh, solutions onto them. They're, they're actually listening to what what people need in their homes. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I think that. And Seth, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I, I feel like here in the states, the the push is always coming from the the integrator side to get these, you know, fire and security companies, manufacturers to play nice and and let us integrate. And it sounds like there's a concerted effort, maybe on the part of, of fire and security firms over there, to uh, pursue the home technology market and figure out how they can how they can work better with us. And and uh, it's just interesting. I hadn't really thought of of that angle. But to me, it seems like a no brainer. Like there's a real value add there for fire and security companies, um, to come in and work closer with, uh, the home technology channel. And, um, I just feel like here in the States, we're kind of having to pull them into it, sometimes kicking and screaming. I don't know. What do you think, Seth? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it, the security market and security industry is a lot older than the home automation industry. And, 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 and a lot of home automation companies were born out of the security industry. Um, so they, they have taken those products that they have been using for years and continue to use them for even substantially longer uh, period of times. Uh, and that's why you see the security systems today here in the States. I mean, they, they look like they're right out of the 1980s. They, they have not been updated. They haven't changed their programming. They haven't changed their equipment. It's there, there've been very little updates, um, to go along with them. And yeah, I, I would say it's very difficult to get a security company to realize, uh, the value of being able to integrate with their system, uh, over, over than what, what their original goal is. Their original goal is to create a very secure system, um, to monitor a house, uh, for Berg and fire and punching a hole in it for an API <laughs> is, is kind of against, uh, what they're trying to do there. You know, as soon as you do that, you open up all sorts of issues that, that are security issues. And I can see why they, they resist that. But at the same time, the industry is definitely headed down or has been headed down that road for a number of years. And, uh, you're now starting to see even some of the, the, the most, you know, this is companies with that have been dragging their feet forever, try and introduce, you know, basic APIs and, and integration modules and that kind of thing. So it's getting better, but it's not quite there yet, I would say. Right. Yeah, I would agree. I thought that was interesting. Um, well, Chris, we're kind of running tight on our time here. Uh, I, I want to know if you did anything particularly fun out there. I know that the uh, the social scene is always a big deal at these trade shows and, and we go out there to take care of business and and network and, and make some connections and learn about some new tools. But but part of what we do at these shows is uh, connect with old industry friends and, and hopefully go out and, and have a good time. So did you do anything particularly fun out there um, on a personal note? Yes, at the, the end of the first day of the show, they, they held their the Smart Buildings Award, which, you know, I was lucky enough to be one of the judges on that. So took full advantage of the hospitality after the show, a uh, free bar. <laughs> and... Yeah, you know that that's let your hair down, you know, away from the the show floor, away from 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 projects and site, uh, and have a after hours chat with with friends and colleagues in the industry. Awesome. Any monkey nuts this year? No, that's that's just ISE. That's just just <laughs> Amsterdam. That is. That's reserved for Amsterdam. Okay, got it. Well, we'll we'll be sure to uh, we'll be sure to get you on after uh, after ISE as well. Um, let, let's touch on it just because I did I did mention it earlier and, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Um, like I said briefly, um, I'm sure there's a ton of implications and and gosh, you could arguably probably do a whole discussion about Brexit. But I just want to know, you know, the quick version. How do you feel like this affects you as a as the owner of a home technology company? Well, first concerns are are prices going to come up? Um, that's something that we've spoken to colleagues in the industry. You know, have you seen any price increases? We've we've had announcements from suppliers saying that it's under review at the moment. Things are held, or um, you know, they're they're waiting to see as 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 the suppliers to the industry. Um, but they've also said, you know, it, you know, it is likely um, we're going to see some price increases. Is it going to affect projects? Again, we initially we got. Um, contacted by 
some of our, our customers just saying, Chris, I think it's a good opportunity to do a bit of a budget review just to see where we're at on the projects. Uh, is there anywhere you know we can we can rein anything in just to to make sure we do hit budget? Is anything creeping over at this stage? Um, and, and we've dealt with that um, quite quickly because people were expecting quick reactions on that. Uh, in the UK, we've seen we now have a new prime minister. We have a new cabinet um, surrounding our, our new prime minister that's happened much quicker than expected we thought that was going to be a long uh, two you know, two month process before we saw a new prime minister it's happened within weeks of the former prime minister uh, resigning we've just seen a bit of a little bit of you know unsettlement in the in the water and as a small business we're quite flexible we're adapting to that we've not seen a you know anything cancelled, but we have heard again rumours, or, or possibly maybe more than rumours, of people having projects cancelled, you know, large residential or or multi-dwelling, you know, commercial commercial projects have been cancelled on them. So, you know, it is impacting in our businesses. Yeah, I can imagine that the uncertainty of moving forward on a project that costs millions or if not tens of millions of, of pounds or, or dollars would be uh, very, very, very risky at this point in time, just because of the that, that one thing, uncertainty. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've reached out to some of our subcontractors who, uh, just to make sure that they're all, they're all okay, they're all on a good footing, just to, you know, if, if it does get rocky. You know, we're all in it together, and we we can all help each other to get through things if they do get um, if things do get get rocky. But again, small businesses are actually more resilient uh, than people give them credit for. Um, so you know, we're, we're, we'll ride it out if things go go a bit a bit wrong. But yep, we don't. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was going to say here in the states. So I went th- went straight through the depression with two small businesses. Uh, you know, I, I left one during the recession and, and went to another one uh, and, and just started building from there. Uh, and, and since we were small and, and agile, we could, uh, we could just move along and, and, and who cared what was going on with the, uh, with the political or, or economic, uh, you know, it was tough, but uh, we, we just got through it. We went out and found the work and, and did what we had to do to, uh, to keep the doors open. So um, yeah, that's, that's what, you, that's what it looks like you may have to do for a little while. And, and who knows, maybe, maybe things will just stabilize there and um, move right along. Things seem to be moving quickly and changing quickly. That's for sure. Um, Chris, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time and, and coming on the show to talk to us about uh, EI Live. Uh, if people want to reach out to you and, and touch base, uh, where, where's the best place for them to do that? The easiest way is to just start adding hashtag live install to your tweets. You'll, you'll very quickly appear on, on my radar. Uh, you'll get engagement from hundreds of other businesses in the industry across the world um, so use the hashtag if you want to get in touch directly you know, at live install you know, on twitter's quickest way to, to get me great well i just want to ag- uh, echo what seth said and, and thank you again for taking the time to join us and uh encourage our listeners to go check out live install on twitter it's a great resource so chris thanks again we'll let you go thank you good night guys